Hey everybody, Arnaldo Waffman here with Gear at First. We are on the last day of this, of this incredible summer giveaway. And today I'm here with two absolutely incredible people. I'll let them introduce themselves. Hey everyone, I'm Justin Perry from Pangolin Laser Systems. I'm Aaron McDonald, Technical Support Manager from Pangolin Laser Systems. Today we're going to talk about laser safety. You know, we've mentioned lasers throughout this entire summer, and most importantly, that lasers can be very dangerous if you don't use them properly. Pangolin, I mean, we hear this name everywhere. Anytime we hear lasers, we hear you guys. So tell us a little bit about what you do for the industry. So Pangolin Laser Systems, uh, we've been in business for 30 years, and we really developed a lot of the laser light show technology that allows you to design and create laser light shows. Everything from your software and hardware to a lot of your laser safety systems, and now we also offer a line of laser projectors as well. Awesome. So... I guess we're going to start from the very beginning then as far as, you know, laser safety and all that. You know, becoming a laserist, I remember years ago, it was, it was a scary thing. To this day, it still sounds kind of scary because you hear all these terms like variances and, you know, the possibility of, you know, hurting somebody with lasers. And just overall, there doesn't seem to be a very clear-cut way. So I'm hoping this video will kind of give everybody the one path of becoming a true laserist. So first, let's talk about how do you become a laserist? Sure. So one of the, the first steps in becoming a laserist that's, um, you know, everybody's kind of searching for their first laser projector. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're going to find uh, your laser projector, you want to first and foremost make sure that that projector is certified and compliant with CDRH and FDA regulations. So it begs the question, how do I do that? Yeah. Um, a very simple way is to go to regulations.gov. If the manufacturer you are considering purchasing from has certified and compliant equipment, you should be able to pull up their manufacturer's variants at regulations.gov. Um, this website was set up in conjunction with the FDA to allow you to browse and search uh, FDA-related compliance materials. So uh, it covers not only laser light show equipment, but also some of the industrial and medical laser-related equipment in the field. Um, so that's a, that's a real surefire way to see if the projector you're trying to purchase is in fact certified and compliant with the CDRH and FDA re regulations. So with that being said, I mean, let's say I, I pull up, you know, I go on there and I pull up a manufacturer's variance. How do I tell if it's current? Is there anything that I need to be on the lookout for? Yeah, absolutely. It's another great question. Um, so each year as a projector manufacturer, you're required to file some additional paperwork keeping your manufacturer's variants up to date. Um, for example, if you come out with a new line of lasers, that new line needs to be additionally certified under your manufacturer's variants. So when you're browsing different manufacturers and, and ensuring that you are purchasing a certified and compliant piece of equipment, um, you want to look real cl closely at the dates of their variants, make sure that it's still in effect. Um, and you also want to make sure and read very carefully that the model of laser you are purchasing is also documented within their manufacturer's variants. Okay. So once you find a laser projector, you know, that fits our needs and we know that is legal to use here, so can we just buy it and use it right away or is there something we have to do? Sure. Uh, another great question. So in the United States, um, you're required to have what's called a laser light show variance. A real easy way to think about this is that it's your license to operate a laser show. It's a promise between you and the FDA that you're going to do everything you can to ensure the safety of your audience when performing a laser light show. Um, within a laser light show variance, it's going to document your general setup and testing procedures, and it's going to allow you to prove to the FDA how you can guarantee the safety of your audience. Um, the laser light show variance is also going to document the model of projectors that you are using. So if your laser light show variance was written to cover, say, for example, our Club Max line or it could be X Lasers Mobile Beat line, though the model of projector you're using needs to be documented within your variance in order for you to be compliant. Okay. 
Now, you know, as with any industry, there's always people that try to skirt by underneath the law. What happens if you are doing a show without a variance? Is there a laser police? You know, I've, I've had some experiences where we have run into laser police. But right now, who are the laser police? And what happens if they see that you are running a show without a variance? Yeah, another great question. So in the United States, lasers are regulated by the FDA. Um, there's a subcommittee called the CDRH that does kind of the day-to-day -day operations for the FDA. Uh, the CDRH does have inspectors set up throughout the United States that do go in and check the compliance and regulations of laser light shows and displays taking place. Um, I don't know if we'll call them the laser police, but they are inspectors that are out there that are going to shows to make sure that you're using certified and compliant projectors and that you as the operator are a variance operator. Um, we've also, in our discussions with the FDA, heard that they're partnering with local fire marshals and local police agencies to help train them on how to inspect a local nightclub or a local show to ensure compliance as well. Uh, recently in Orlando, we had a customer doing a laser light show at a hotel, um, normal ballroom setup. He's a mobile DJ as well. And the compliance manager for the hotel actually requested to see his variants. So my point in saying this is it shows how far down the line the education is starting to go now. More and more people understand the dangers involved with lasers. They understand that you need to operate a show in a safe and compliant manner. And so as a result, more and more people are becoming educated on what to ask a laser light show company in order to ensure their compliance. Uh, it protects them as the venue, but it also protects you guys as the operators of laser shows um, because you want to make sure you're doing stuff in a safe and compliant way. Awesome. Now, you had mentioned regulations.gov uh, for us to check manufacturers. Can a hotel also check our variants on there, too? Will our variances be posted there? And then what's the whole process from start to finish of getting the variances? Is that something that, for example, Pangolin would help out with? And can we be denied for any reason? Uh, another great question. So regulations.gov will um, list your laser light show variants once it has been approved and granted. So you, you'll be able to log on there and pull it up and see the authenticity of that. Um, in terms of the question of, you know, how, what is the process of getting a variance, it's kind of uh, specific on the manufacturer you purchase from. Um, if you buy a projector from us, we're going to file your variance electronically. We work with a third-party company called Extega to do this. Um, it's run by a gentleman named Brian Gonzalez. He's actually the president of the laser display uh, trade association called ILDA. Okay. So he's a very well-credentialed individual. And um, so he's going to get some basic information from you, such as your name, email, telephone number. Um, he's also going to ask you some questions about the type of shows you're going to be doing, whether they're indoors, outdoors, things of that nature. And he's also going to ask you what model of laser projector you're using from us. So if you're using our Club Max line, our Atom line, which is a little high, more high power, or our Spectrum line, um, he's going to document the specific models of lasers that you're using within your variants when he files it. Um, some other manufacturers also do more of a manual style where um, your paperwork is manually submitted to the CDRH and FDA. That's a, a totally acceptable and approved method as well. But you as an operator, you need to make sure before you start performing these shows in public that you do um, get your variants uh, filed and approved and in place. Awesome. So, you know, one of the terms that we've heard, uh, you know, in different forms and stuff we talk about variances is LSO. So what is an LSO? Is that something that you should have or that's required to have within your company? And how do you become one? Um, so LSO stands for Laser Safety Officer. Um, if you're going to be doing shows professionally, I highly suggest you take the time to go in and um, attend a Laser Safety Officer course. Um, these are offered through the trade association for um, the laser show industry called ILDA. Mm -hmm. They have an LSO training. But you can also find them through other uh, laser safety um, organizations such as the Laser Institute of America. Um, that's another big one. They offer an LSO training course as well. So, um, you know, if you're going to be doing it professionally, if you're trying to do this on a large scale, um, and if you're just an individual who wants to make sure all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, take an LSO course. They're only a couple hundred dollars. It's going to be very informative for you guys as operators out in the field. Um, and it's a good way to ensure that you're formally educated on the proper way to set up and perform a show. Awesome. So as far as, you know, lasers, what happens, you know, like what can happen if you don't follow safety, um, the, the safety regulations that they have set in place? What are some of the general operating procedures? Once I get my variants, what are some of the conditions that I'm going to see? 
Um, so a variance can be written in a lot of different ways. So let me start off by saying that. Um, depending on the manner in which your variance was filed, it can stipulate and authorize, to do, uh, authorize you to do various setups and different types of, of displays. Mm -hmm. Um, general rule of thumb for, for the average laserist, let's say, is that you're going to keep those beams three meters off from the highest point that a person could be standing in your audience. Okay. Um, and you want to keep it two meters to the side from anywhere that they could touch. So we call it the three meter by two meter rule. Um, a variance can also be written um, to allow you to project into an audience area if you have some additional training and additional safety systems put inside your projector. It's, uh, it's a system called PASS. Um, it gets built into your projector and then with some additional training and LSO, uh, you're gonna be required to take an LSO course. If you go through these additional steps, you can also be approved to do audience scanning. I will say it's a bit of a complex process, but again, it, it, my point in bringing this up is that a variance can be written and many different ways to document the different types of laser shows that would be taking place, giving you the approval to do them. Awesome. Now, you talked about, you know, the, uh, the safe scanning area. And I guess that's one of the things that always scared me about using, like, just regular DMX lasers. You know, we've had to use kind of duct tape to be able to fit everything in. I can't imagine that's the right way of doing it. So what are the software benefits of using a software like QuickShow of being able to be safer with our lasers? Um, so a couple of things. I'll start off talking a little bit about the safety elements on a projector itself. Um, if, we, uh, if we look here, for example, I've got um, our Club Max line right here. So this is, uh, this is what we call a Club Max 3000. Um, first thing you're going to notice is that we have a manual shutter on the front. So this comes up. And you can position this in a different area to block output from the laser to go from going in a specified area. So this is, you know, just one very basic safety feature. You're going to find this on most any laser projector. On the back of the laser projector, you're going to notice uh, a few additional things. First thing being our key switch. So you need you have an off and an on position. Um, this is an interlock. And this plugs in right here, but this slot is actually used for your e-stop. So, and we'll demonstrate what an e-stop is here in a minute, but it's basically um, a mushroom switch that when triggered will disable all laser output going to the projector. And this is actually required when doing a public laser light show. So your e-stop signal is going to connect here. Um, in addition, on the back of the projector, you're going to notice we have what's called a scan, sa uh, scan fail safety. So when this is enabled, if the projector detects you performing an effect that it feels is unsafe, it's going to trigger the mechanical shutter inside of the laser projector to block any output from coming out. Okay. Um, in addition to that, in the software, uh, our software called QuickShow, we've got some added safety features that are built into the um, into the program. So we've got um, an electronic e-stop in QuickShow that we call a blackout button. Um, and in addition, within QuickShow, we have a feature called zones. So what a zone is going to allow you to do is to set a master projection area and then defined projection areas within that master projection area. So say, for example, this is my master projection area. Let's use this basic square shape right here. Within that master projection area, and Aaron's got the test pattern set up now, I can set specific zones within this area that I want laser output to display into. Okay. So this can be used as a safety feature as well to prevent lasers from going in an area that you don't want them to go. Um, and to actually demonstrate the e-stop, if you ever notice anything potentially dangerous taking place, your e-stop, you hit it, you'll notice we automatically killed laser output from taking place. Um, you know, this is, this is your first and foremost uh, safety feature that you want to you wanna trigger if you notice anything dangerous taking place. Just hit that, hit that mushroom switch and it's going to stop all laser output from taking place. I just started back up. You're going to just lift this back up, and then you'll notice we got a button it's called Start. You'll click that, and then in the software, you're going to enable your laser output, and you'll be good to go again. Awesome. We can also talk a little bit about the emission delay. Okay. So what an emission delay is, 
is um, before the laser will actually output, it will wait for about 10 seconds before physical laser output takes place. Um, this is another safety feature. So if somebody tries to walk in front of the laser while you're setting up, let's say you're setting up a zone and um, somebody, ju you know, a technician's walking by and might walk in front of the output window of the laser, you have a 10 second window to say, hey, get out of the way. You know, I'm going to have laser output coming here. So we call it an emission delay. It's delaying the actual output from the laser projector from taking place. Okay, awesome. Um, so as far as overall safety tips, you know, maybe some do's and don'ts. Is there anything that you, you know, you readily recommend to the beginner? You know, like what are some of the things, definitely do's and don'ts and things that they may have thought, not thought about when it comes to laser safety? Uh, so the first thing I'll say is don't buy lasers on eBay. 99% um, of the lasers you're going to find on eBay are non-compliant and un not certified. Um, and there are ramif ramifications in place if you get caught using non-certified uh, equipment. Um, at the very least, if you get caught, your gear is going to get confiscated. And any variance that you may have had, it's probably going to get terminated. Um, there can also be... Uh, penalties such as financial penalties in place if you get caught using non-compliant equipment um, and there can be possible criminal penalties as well we've seen a few instances where people were doing some pretty aggressive um, illegal audience scanning with non-certified projectors and there were some um, some ramifications for those people as well so step one use certified safe equipment um, step two Make sure you get a variance. Make sure you file the appropriate paperwork with the manufacturer that you purchase from. And actually, they're required to file that for you. So, um, you know, if you purchase a laser projector and the manufacturer doesn't discuss the steps to take to get your variance, that's an immediate red flag like, hey, is this guy even a legitimate uh, seller of laser light show equipment? Um, after that, when you're setting up and performing your laser light shows, you're going to want to do it in a manner that um, where you can guarantee the safety of people in your audience. So one thing is set that manual shutter that we were showing earlier, set it in a position to where you can guarantee you're not going to be projecting into an audience area. It's a, it's a block, right? So you can block laser output manually from going into a specified area. Um, when you're starting your basic setup procedures, make sure your e-stop is properly connected. Test it out. Make sure it's working properly. Um, when you're setting up your zones, clear people out of the area and make sure you set up your zones in a way that are also not going into an audience area and to make sure you're adhering with that three meter by two meter rule. Um, so these are just some basic safety tips to, to follow when you're set up and performing a laser light show. Luckily, with today's laser light show projectors, um, these, these are not, these can be DMX controlled, but you can also control them through software. So unlike a DMX laser where you were talking about, you know, I got to duct tape it here and I got to, you know, kind of configure things in a strange way to prevent output from going in specific areas, you can really control a lot of this through software now, which makes it a lot easier. But um, we also have these additional safety features in place to ensure the compliance. Awesome. And then the last thing that I think, especially on DJs, that's in a lot of their minds is you see a lot of these like uh, the pinpoint lasers, you know, like Bliss has one. Uh, now everybody decided to decorate a Christmas house with them or even have like the laser dots to move around. And they have these aimed at the audience. Is that a safety risk? Is the manufacturer not supposed to be showing videos like that? And how do you know when you can and can, you know, use a laser like that? And more importantly, why do you not need a variance for those kind of lasers? Um, so speaking in terms of Bliss Lights, we're actually, um, we have a very close cooperation with that company. Um, Bliss Lights products are actually, the, the output power of each beam is less than, is five milliwatts or less. Mm -hmm. um, it's a class two product. And what we mean by class two is it poses no inherent eye risk. So mm -hmm. to specifically answer the question, does a Bliss Light propose, um, uh, could it, could it be potentially eye dangerous? No. These are class two products. Each beam coming out of there is five milliwatts or less. It is not inherently eye um, dangerous to your eyes. Uh, you mentioned a laser dock. Um, I think everybody should know that is technically an illegal laser projector in the United States. These are not certified. It is a class four projector, and it does not meet the FDA's uh, safety requirements to be certified in the United States. They've talked about working on this, but from what we've seen, there's been no actual um, 
action taken to certify those projectors. So you shouldn't even be using a laser dock in the United States. It is not certified, um, and it could be potentially eye dangerous because it is a class four projector. So if uh, a static beam comes out of that thing and hits somebody in the eye, yeah, you could do permanent eye damage, so. So while this doesn't directly apply to the live event industry, I've seen, you know, a lot of people in general playing around with the laser pens, like the really powerful laser pens, not the ones for PowerPoint presentations. I mean, do those fall under variance? If somebody's using one of those outside, is that illegal if they can hit, you know, planes and stuff with it? Or, you know, how, what exactly is, well, how exactly does the law regard these laser pens, the powerful ones? Um, so lasers are, it's not so much if it's a pen or a projector. It's really more defined uh, by the output power of the device. Um, so you have class one, class two, mm -hmm. class three, and class four. And within each class, you have subcategories. Um, and these classes are broken down in terms of power. So if a laser pointer um, can emit a power level above five milliwatts, um, it needs to be a certified device. Um, it does pose inherent risk to people that, that would operate it. So uh, a lot of these high power pro uh, laser pointers that you see people projecting into airspace, yeah, they, they can definitely be dangerous. Um, if you were to hold one of those to in, or project one into a person's eye um, or if it was to shine up into airspace and hit a, hit a plane, um, yeah, it definitely poses some, some potential risk. Um, and this is pretty heavily re regulated now. So you know, I, don't, I don't say this to scare people or anything like that, but um, there have been several instances now of um, college kids, for example, shining these high power pointers up into airspace trying to hit a plane. Well, they have a way now and a means to figure out and pinpoint where that projection came from. Oh, wow. And there have been a few reported cases of individuals getting some severe penalties, uh, criminal penalties, as a result of projecting um, an illegal laser pointer up into airspace trying to hit a plane. So, um, you know, laser pointers, just as laser projectors are regulated and fall under the same criteria uh, based on their power level. And you can you can Google laser power levels and, and see if the power of your laser pointer and where it falls in the category and whether or not it needs to be a certified device. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, if your laser pointer is above 5 milliwatts in power, don't project it up into airspace and try to hit a plane. It's uh, you, you might think it's cool, but it actually, it, you know, it could be dangerous. And if, you know, picture yourself being somebody on that flight, do you want your your captain or, or the pilot being distracted from a laser pointer going up? Uh, probably not. Yeah. So, you know. Well, I remember because one of my buddies, he's a pilot, and he said it's not really, I guess, the laser hitting the eye. It's that the way the windshield works, it completely diffracts the laser, and now they can't see anything in front of them. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. We've actually, um, if you want to read an article about it, if you go to pangolin.com and you go to our educational section, um, then you can go to uh, laser safety, and we've got multiple articles uh, talking about projecting lasers into airspace. There's a few articles specifically talking about laser pointers, um, and those projecting into airspace and the dangers that can be involved with that. And you are right. Um, it's not so much the laser pointer, you know, hitting the pilot in the eye. The probability of that is actually probably pretty low. It's more of if that goes into the cockpit area and then passes through that glass, it can diffract the beam. And, and it's that instance of a bunch of diffracted laser light going into that cockpit area that that could be pretty troublesome for a pilot. So oh, absolutely. we've talked about some of the safety features within the hardware itself. Um, and then we talked about, you know, feet safety protocols indoors. A couple of things I actually want to talk about is the software. What can the software do to help us be even safe, safer? And later on, actually, we could talk a little bit also in outdoor shows, too, how that works. But software-wise, what can Quick Show do to make sure that I'm running my show as safely as possible? Um, so, first of all, Quick Show's got what I like to call an electronic e-stop, uh, also known as a blackout button. So, if Aaron triggers the blackout, it's immediately going to disable laser output, as you've seen here. You can do that by pressing the escape key. You can do it from a mouse and keyboard by pressing the blackout button in the software. Or you can do it from a MIDI console. We've got an APC Mini set up here that you can see. Um, and you can press the blackout button on the APC Mini. And once again, disable your laser output from the MIDI console. Uh, you can also map a blackout to a DMX console or another MIDI console. You don't have to use the APC Mini, and um, you can blackout that way as well. Um, further inside the software, 
One of the best safety features that we built in is what we call a beam attenuation map. Uh, we call it the BAM for short. So what the beam attenuation map is going to allow you to do is to black laser output, black out laser output in a specified area or reduce the amount of laser power going into a specified area. Um, so we can take a quick look inside the software here. You'll see Aaron's got the beam attenuation map pulled up. And what we're going to do is we're going to black laser output from going up into the top left-hand corner of our projection. So we've got a few tools in the software to do this, and you'll notice that he's very quickly blacked out laser output from going into that top left-hand area. Now, this becomes pretty handy if you're working in a venue where the lasers are positioned kind of in a perhaps an awkward arrangement where it's difficult to prevent them from from possibly projecting into an audience area. So you can put up your manual shutter and then in addition as an extra fail safe, set a beam attenuation map just to further guarantee no laser output would go into that audience area. Um, this can also be used, for example, if you want to prevent lasers from hitting a video projector or a camera. Um, a lot of people might not know that if a laser beam comes into contact with a with a camera lens or a video projector, it can actually damage it. So using a beam attenuation map, you could black laser output from going into that specified area. So let's say, for example, there was a video projector in the middle of our abstract that's running right here, and we want to black that out. So we'll black out laser output from going into that area here, uh, just to give you a quick example. So... It's kind of a crude example. You'll see there's no output in that center area we just quickly defined. And you can get a lot more dialed in with this. Mm -hmm. um, the tools will uh, actually allow you to get uh, pixel by pixel where you want that to go. But um, just a rough working example of how the beam attenuation map works. Now, why is the actual attenuation itself moving? It looks, or at least it looks like it's moving. It's the abstract. Yeah, it's following, it's following the animation of the abstract. Oh, okay. Right? So. What's the difference between using attenuation and actually using the... Um, the resize tool that's in there. Is there one that should be used before the other? So the the resize tool is geometric correction. Um, I like to explain it like this. Um, let's let's black out for a minute here, Aaron. All right, let's put up our um, our classic orientation test pattern, or what we call the top test pattern. All right. Um, so right here we've got our master projection area. I can make this bigger, smaller. Uh, we could max this out a, uh, a lot further than what we have set up here. But um, this is our master projection area. And then within our master projection area, we can set up multiple zones. So we'll kind of give you a quick example of this. Okay. So we've got our master projection area. There's zone one, and I could make zone one a little bit smaller within our master projection area if I want to, using those geometric settings you were talking about earlier. So now we've made a smaller zone one, and we could position that maybe up in the top right-hand corner as Aaron's doing right now. And then we'll come in and we'll make an additional zone. Let's call it zone eight. And we'll change the size of that, and maybe we'll put that in the top left-hand corner. So now I've got two individual zones set up within my master projection area. And I can apply a beam at an individual beam attenuation map to each of those zones. So in zone eight, if I want to block out the center of that um, of that specific zone to ensure no laser output goes there, mm -hmm. we can we can black out the laser output there, as Aaron is demonstrating right here. And now you'll see that there's an area blacked out within that zone where there is no specified laser output. And I definitely want to just kind of show so the audience knows that this is all being shown and done with one projector. They're not using multiple laser projectors. If somebody wanted to use, let's say, for example, multiple projectors, how does that work? I mean, do you have a controller for each one or can they be daisy chained? This is um, it's a great question we get a lot. And uh, it's called independent versus shared control. Um, so as a working example... We've got two laser projectors right here. We'll call it laser one, and we'll call this guy laser two. Uh, if I have two laser projectors set up, and I only have one piece of control hardware going into laser one, these two lasers are going to do the same thing at the same time. It's, um, it's shared control, also called a daisy chain. So 
basic working setup is you've got your FB3 ILDA cable running into projector one. You'll daisy chain that signal over to projector two with another ILDA cable. Both lasers will do the same thing at the same time. Uh, if you want independent control where the lasers do something different at the same time, you need an individual piece of control hardware for each projector. And we've actually got a great tutorial video about this online. Uh, I think we could probably link to that that will walk you through step by step how to set up a laser show with both shared control and individual control. Awesome. So then let's talk about, you know, quick show. Like if, you know, let's say a DJ that's watching this right now, they want to get into lasers or even an uh, LD that's never done lasers before. And there's quite a few of us out there. You know, you guys obviously have tons of different softwares out there. You know, we've heard most common, Quick Show, Beyond. There's even like the LD2000 and all that. So what's the main differences between Quick Show and Beyond? And what should they get started with first? And what are some of those features? Um, so if you're new to lasers, I, I generally recommend starting with Quick Show. Um, it's a very powerful software. It's um, You've got live control operation in there. You've got a timeline, so you can program um, timeline-based laser shows. You have got a drawing program and an editing program, a text generator if you want to do text, a logo generator if you want to do custom logos. Um, and it's going to help build a foundation for you on designing and creating your own laser light shows. Um, we say Quick Show is powerful, affordable, and easy to use. And it really kind of lives up to that reputation. Um, it offers you a ton of tools, but in a very user-friendly format. So that if you are new to lasers, the learning curve is, is not as difficult. Um, if you're a professional lighting designer... Mm -hmm. Or if you're a little bit more advanced in the laser industry, maybe you've already used Quick Show or um, you've been working with laser for a while, Beyond is probably going to be more appropriate from you. Uh, Beyond essentially takes all of the features within Quick Show and expands upon them, and we've added a lot of additional features on top of that. Um, if you like to run your laser show from a lighting console and you want to be able to individually script out what your, your faders, your knobs, and your buttons and sliders do, Beyond's going to be for you. Um, if you want to do uh, things over SMPTE time timecode, um, maybe t you know run a time-coded laser show in, uh, in conjunction with some other lighting, pyro, or music, Beyond's going to be for you. Um, Beyond also has some more interactive features, so uh, it's a pretty cool thing. You can actually control the lasers from an Xbox Connect, so you move your hand, we can move the lasers back and forth. With the, uh, with the motion of your body, so it's another neat feature. Um, it's also got a built-in 3D animation program, so if you want to do an animated laser show like what you might see at a planetarium or you might see at um, kind of like a, a Dis uh, Disney World or a Universal Studios, they do a lot of animated laser shows, Beyond's probably going to be more for you. Um, but it's strictly if you're, if you're new to lasers, it's your first time, start with Quick Show, build a foundation for yourself, um, and you can always upgrade to Beyond later. So it's not that you have to buy a whole new system. You can actually just upgrade your software and purchase just that software license to get where you need to go. One of the things that I've loved about your software is that even if I don't have the time to make content right away, there's tons of great content. I've been able to run, you know, theme shows just in the content that you guys have. But obviously, you know, content is king. And after a while, we want to make our own or even share with other people. Do you guys have anything that involves the cloud or any kind of repositories or anything like that? Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked, Arnaldo, because we, we do. Um, so Quick Show is going to come with uh, about 2,000 pre-programmed laser, um, laser animations and pieces of cues. You can think of it as laser clip art. You've got everything from beam effects to graphics to animations, and these animations could be people dancing or holiday-themed animations like Santa Claus, what have you. You've got abstracts like what we're projecting up here. This is an example of an abstract. You've got all that content already preloaded into Quick Show. If you need more, we have a whole platform built out that we do call the Pangolin Cloud. Um, I like to, to kind of talk about it as like an iCloud or an iTunes for laser shows. You can go up onto the Pangolin Cloud and there's over, I think right now we've got over 450 free, totally pre-programmed laser light shows. Um, and there's thousands of additional cues on there that you can download. Um, and once you open the cloud up in the software... It's built right in. You'll see the cloud icon up in your top left-hand corner of the software. And you just create an account. You log in. It's entirely free. We don't charge anything for this. And then you can browse all of the content that we have in there, download it directly to your Quick Show or Beyond workspace, and you're off and running.
That is incredible. So I guess, can you run us through some of the, you know, the different options? I know there's like the sound active LJ and there's even integration with virtual DJ, correct? Yeah, yeah we've got integration with virtual DJ now. Um, Quick Show's got a built-in uh, metronome, so you can control the uh, the laser show to the beat of the music without problem. It's a big question that we get all the time. How do I control my laser show together with music? Can I make them work in harmony? Absolutely. It's one of the foundations of laser show creation. So um, the built-in metronome system is one way of doing that. Virtual laser jockey is another. Um, or if you're doing a pre-programmed show on the timeline, you can actually... Uh, import an audio waveform mm -hmm. and then design your show around that. From my experience, one of the beauties about Quick Show has been that you don't necessarily need to have a lot of laser experience to be able to run a show. I actually find it's easier than DMX software because of all the cues and everything you guys put in. You can literally plug, play it, and have shows ready to go, as long as you're, of course, being safe about it. The workstation doesn't have to be intense either. I mean, we are using, it is, it is a Windows-based program, but we're running VMware or Parallels. Definitely works better on Parallels so far, it seems, than VMware. And just a APC Mini. And that's, that's really all it takes. I mean, you don't even need a hardware controller. You could just use your mouse and keyboard. Yep. So uh, just kind of walk us through real quick. I mean, if you know, you just plug in your laser, have everything ready to go. All right, guys, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the Quick Show software, um, touch on some of the main elements that are beneficial for DJs. So first and foremost, this is our Q grid. Uh, it's broken down into graphics and atmospheric effects. And within each category, we've got some sub tabs with things like logos, um, animals, people and characters, music and dancers, celebrations. Um, in your atmospherics, you've got a lot of liquid sky effects, some beam effects, hot beams and things like that. Um, and so it's very simple. All you need to do is come and click on a cue, and it will immediately project in laser light. So as you go through here, you can select the different content that you want, and boom, it'll automatically project out in laser light. Uh, one of the other cool things that we um, have that a lot of DJs request is, you know, I want to create a logo or a, uh, a custom um, animation for a, cu a customer. How do I do that? So we have a tab called Quick Trace down here. We can open uh, a logo. Let's, let's pull up the SeaWorld one, and immediately it's automatically traced in laser light. You can also animate these logos as well. If you drag and drop it to a queue, right-click on it and edit the frame, it'll bring up a drawing program that allows you to further edit and animate that logo. And we've got some additional tutorials that talk about that as well. Um, another very popular feature is the Quick Text tab. So a lot of customers want to display text on the fly, maybe like happy birthday, things like that. So if we just come into our text editor and type in um, anything we want, let's type in text real quick, we can automatically project this in laser light immediately just by clicking uh, show output. So it makes it very easy to do text on the fly. Another popular thing is our timeline. So if you ever want to uh, pre-program a show, to perhaps to a fav favorite uh, musical track or audio file, you can do this on the timeline. And you very simply just drag and drop your programmed effects onto the timeline. And I'm just doing a crude example here, guys. And you can define the, the amount of time that they're projecting for. You can fade in and fade out. Uh, you can also open up a um, an audio file so that you set your waveform on the timeline and you can program your laser effects to music. And again, we've got a full tutorial series for all of these things mm -hmm. already online on our YouTube channel. There's over uh, 19 tutorials right now awesome. for the Quick Show software. Uh, they're going to dive real deep into each of these features as well. Um, we recently released Quick Show 3.0. And um, again, kind of catering to the DJ community, we built some plugins for the virtual DJ software. So what this is going to allow you to do is to control Quick Show from virtual DJ, um, triggering your laser effects based on a, a set BPM within virtual DJ. And if you go to our Quick Show 3.0 tutorial video, you'll be able to see that as well. Um, and one of the other new things is a lot of people wanted more MIDI functionality. They perhaps didn't want to operate from a PC and preferred the tactile feel that a MIDI console offers. And so we've created a custom map for the APC Mini that's going to allow you to run your laser show from this MIDI device. And it's truly plug and play. You don't have to map anything out. You don't have to script anything, script anything out. Once you connect the USB device, it is already set up and ready to go. So I can toggle through my Q grid here, triggering some different effects. Um, I've got some sliders down here for things like colors. Um, we can do some rotations. 
we can do some animations, we can control our brightness. So you've got all these effects built into the uh, profile that's made for the APC Mini that's already plug and play ready to go. And if I ever need to black out, I can just come up here, black out, and start fresh whenever I need to. We've covered quite a bit on laser safety for you know the operator and for the audience. But let's talk about safety as far as the units themselves. You know, is there such a thing as a one size fits all as far as getting really good liquid skies, beams, and graphics? Can you burn out a laser or the motors? Because those motors are going pretty fast. I mean, is there a shelf life on this or even a cooling period that they would need? So um, there's a lot of different laser projectors on the market today, but some key things you want to look for um, to kind of find a one size fits all laser. Um, first and foremost, look for look at the scan speed. Um, the scan speed is going to define the type of effects the projector will allow you to create. So you want to try to find a system that's rated to 30K at 8 degrees or higher. That's going to allow you to do nice aerial beam effects, liquid skies, but it's also going to be fast enough that it can do some of the more advanced text graphics and logos that you, uh, you might see coming in from some of those professional displays. Um, you also want to look for analog modulation. What that means uh, in simplified terms is that it's going to allow you to fade in and fade out across different colors. So um, a TTL-based projector is limited to seven colors only. An analog-based projector is going to allow you to create millions of different color combinations because you can fade in and fade out between those, those different colors. Um, another very important thing you want to look at is the, the scan angle that is being specified and how wide those scanners can project. So, for example, on these Club Maxes, these are rated to 40K at 8 degrees with a plus or minus 60 degree scan angle. So they are capable of projecting very, very wide um, allowing you to get those nice aerial effects. But if a projector is specified to say only 40 degree optical angle or perhaps only 30 degree optical angle and you try to you try to max that scan angle out, you can end up overdriving your scanner and, and damaging the projector. Um, talking about the physical laser source, um, all of our laser sources inside of our projector are, are have a device called Lasorb on them that protects them and extends the lifetime of the laser dial. Not all manufacturers use this. Um, the general shelf life of our projectors is going to be right around 10,000 hours, mostly because we do put that Lasorb component on there, whereas some manufacturers that aren't using this, you can uh, burn out the laser... Uh, laser source a little bit faster, especially when these things are exposed to very dusty environments. Think about being permanently installed in a club or something like that. When a lot of dust accumulates inside of the system, it can build up what's called ESD or electrostatic discharge, and this can actually damage your laser diodes and sources. So we put this laser orb component on each dial to kind of extend the lifetime of them in that sense. Um, now, with our projectors and with most projectors these days, you can actually swap out the module inside. So if the laser, you know, if, if you extend the lifetime of the, the module inside and you do reach its limitation, you don't have to go and buy a whole new projector. You can actually just swap out your module inside. Um, think about it like changing the light bulb in a lamp. So, you know, those are some general functionality and basic parameters relating to the laser. Awesome. And then going back to the software and the FB3, the you know box, basically it's US, uh, USB to ILDA. How does the license work? Is the license in the box itself? Is it by the computer? And if it is by the computer, or let's say one computer dies on me, how can I transfer that license to another computer? So with QuickShow, the uh, the software is just automatically going to run as soon as you connect the FB3 QS hardware. Um, and you can install QuickShow on as many PCs as you like. As long as you connect the FB3 one time, QuickShow will run. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility in that regard. Okay. With our Beyond software, it's licensed to a specific hardware device. So in order to run the Beyond software, you need to have that licensed hardware connected to actually get laser output. Um, and it works in kind of a master-slave setup. So if I've got multiple FB3s, let's say we have, you know, let's for example's sake say, say this is an FB3, um, and my Beyond license was tied to this, as long as this hardware is connected, I can use this additional FB3 as an output within the Beyond software. So this acts as a slave for our master hardware device. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Um, anything else that you'd like to say to the, you know, to them, like any other safety tips or any, you know, avoid doing this kind of thing? Um, 
I would basically say learn about what you're going to do before you go and do it. Um, if you go to pangolin.com, we've got a whole educational section of our website built out, and this is categorized based on different questions that people have asked us. So what is a laser light show? What are the types of shows I can create? Uh, what are my laser safety requirements? Um, what are the different types of laser light shows that can be programmed? How do I set up a live show? All of this is broken down into categories so that you can browse the content that you need and find a, a post with specific information on the type of information you're looking for. So if you have questions, I would definitely suggest going there as a starting point. We also wrote a book about laser light shows. It's called How to Make a Laser Show. Um, and so if anybody wants a copy of that, you can email contact at pangolin.com and it's going to really break down from start to finish how to go about creating uh, laser light shows, how to get into the laser light show industry and things like that. Um, and for those of you operating in the United States, just make sure you're doing it in a compliant manner. Um, use compliant equipment, follow the, the U.S. regulations. They're in place for a reason. It's not worth the potential risk of getting your gear confiscated or doing something potentially dangerous. You know, play, play by the book. It's, um, it's good for the industry. It's good for you as a professional, and it helps keep everybody else safe. Awesome. And, you know, from one of the end users, one of the things that I love about Pangolin is that many softwares in our industry, whether it's lighting or a DJ or anything like that, there is no phone support. You guys do have phone support, correct? Yeah. Which, <laughs> and guys, that may be, this may be one of the few companies that offer phone support, but I know you guys have helped people via Facebook even or email. I mean, you're pretty easy to get a hold of. So um, as far as Facebook, because a lot of these guys are on Facebook, they join the groups. Do you guys have a Facebook group that people can go to talk to other laserists and pangolin users? Um, yeah, I'm actually pretty proud. We've got the, the world's largest laser related uh, Facebook group. It's called Powered by Pangolin. There's thousands of laserists on there from all over the world. Um, we've got people from the United States, Germany, the Netherlands, Japan, Korea, Brazil, Colombia, um, literally from all over the world on there. They're sharing uh, practices and, and, you know, just different techniques on how to use the software. Um, they're programming content for each other and sharing information. So it's a great group where you can uh, connect with other laserists from around the world, ask questions, get support and things like that. Awesome. Now, if you're watching this live, stay tuned. Right after this, we are going to do the grand prize giveaway. They're going to be getting the FB3 and Quick Show, correct? That's correct. Awesome. And then we'll be doing some live Q&A. So start writing your questions down. Uh, again, my name is Arnaldo Waffman. We uh, gear it first. Justin Perry, thanks for joining us. Aaron McDonald, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. God bless. We'll see you soon at gearitfirst.com. I know, right? Lighting guys with audio problems. Technically, I'm an audio guy, so that makes this even uh, more embarrassing. Um, I know some of you guys may be hearing a little bit of like uh, background noise. I think that is the fan on this computer. It is running quite uh, fierce there. Okay, so uh, real quick, let's go back to the question about the lasers at weddings, monograms. What have you seen your clients do? Yeah, so uh, at weddings, we have our clients doing quite a few different things. Um, laser graphics, text, and logos definitely seem to be some of the most popular effects. Um, bride and grooms love seeing their names projected up in lasers. Uh, Quick Show Software's got a ton of content in there with, that's uh, celebration-themed, so that tends to be very popular at weddings as well. And um, we see a lot of liquid skies projected, too, or some aerial beam effects when people are dancing. So... What I notice most DJs and event planners doing is kind of mixing these effects up. Maybe when people are dancing, they're doing more of the aerial effects. And then when uh, the bride and groom are walking out or, or kind of during one of the more ceremonial parts of the, the event, they're projecting people's names up in logos or mm -hmm. some of those animations and stuff like that. Awesome. I mean, that's, yeah, again, that's one of the beautiful things about Quick Show. I, I can't say that enough that it has saved my butt multiple times when they're like, Oh, we're doing this theme. Can you do something? Uh, yeah, look, it's already there. So that's awesome. Um, let's see real quick. Uh, we had a couple questions actually that kind of came in side by side. Somebody had asked about the variants. Can you get it by the person or by the company rather? So if you have like, you know, a company and you have multiple people working in it, do you have to get a variance for each individual person? Uh, Jen, it's kind of uh, specific on the individual. What we see a lot of um, larger production companies doing is getting a variance for their company uh, and then listing the operators for their, their company within their variance so that their employees are covered. Um, we've also seen individuals get the variance filed mm -hmm. specifically in their name as well. So when you are filling out your variance paperwork, um, 
you can denote within that if you want it to be on the written under your company or written under you as an individual. Awesome. And then uh, I know we talked about this briefly, but pretty much uh, David Vallejo asked well, when you rent lasers from the dealer, if you have to get a certified yourself or does a dealer do that? And I'm guessing he means buying the laser projector that should already be certified before they sell it to you, correct? So, yeah, well, obviously, if a, a projector is going to get rented out, it needs to be certified and compliant first and foremost. Um, you as the operator, you do need to have a variance, even if you're using some rented equipment. So if a company is going to rent you out laser equipment, you as the operator have to have a variance on file, or you need to be working for a company that has an approved variance on file as a 1099. Awesome. Um Let's see here. Peter, the hubcap dude asks, uh, does the variance allow for outdoor and indoor shows? Uh, it really depends on, again, how your variance is written. Variances can be written in a few different ways. So when you're filing your variance paperwork with a manufacturer, if you do plan on doing outdoor shows, you can request that your variance be written to cover you for outdoor shows. Um, and then there's a few additional safety precautions that need to be taken into account. If you're working outdoors and you have beams going up into airspace, you've always got to notify the FAA prior to the show taking place. And generally, around 30 days prior seems to be a, a kind of rule of thumb that, um, that we see out there. Um, if you're working outdoors and your variance was approved for outdoor use and you're terminating the beams, and what we mean by terminating is that they are projecting um, perhaps onto a building or a backdrop that prevents them from going out into airspace, if your beams are ter terminating, you don't need to notify the FAA. That's That was a change in regulation that happened pretty recently. Okay. So um, to answer the question, yes, you can have your variance written to allow you to do outdoor shows. Awesome. Let me ask you this real quick, kind of like an offshoot on that. So let's say, you know, you're going to have a show that the beams go up in the air. You call the FAA and they approve it. What do they do on their end? Do they literally tell planes don't fly over that area? Or like, what are the safety precautions they take for the sake of the pilots? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're notifying the, the people flying in that general area that there's going to be an aerial laser display taking place. That way, the, the pilots are at least aware of the situation and can try to uh, avoid it in that respect. Okay. So I was wondering, like, do they just tell planes to fly around? Like, uh, that seems almost like too much work. <laughs> um, Michael Thomas asked about the info on the LSO classes. You know, do, yeah. do you have a company that you've worked with in the past that offers them or how can somebody find local LSO classes to them? There's, it's a great question. And there's a few different outlets and channels to do this. Um, first and foremost, you might check out ILDA. It's the International Laser Display Association. Um, we at Pangolin, we've been uh, ILDA members for years. I was actually on the board of directors for ILDA for uh, two years myself, and they offer a uh, laser safety officer training course each year in conjunction with the ILDA conference. Um, there's also other institutes, one's called Laser Safety Institute of America, um, and they offer a laser uh, LSO course as well. So those are two um, credentialed and reputable sources that you could go to to take an LSO safety course. Awesome. Um, David Vallejo, these are actually kind of two back-to-back -back questions here. Uh, so David Vallejo asks, so is all lighting that has lasers required to be variants like the ADJ stingers uh, that have built-in lasers? And then Dominic Moser says, can you legally use a low-power laser like those lasers, even though they can produce shapes and you know different effects and some can even do text? Since there are those low power lasers, can you use those without the variance? It's another great question, and it's really defined by the class of the projector. <clears throat> so, and we should probably post a link to this, Arnaldo. But yes. uh, if you go on Google and you you Google laser classes, you're going to see that lasers are broken up into class one, class two, class three, and class four. And within each of those classes, you have some sub subclasses. So, does it, uh, some of those uh, lower power lasers from like ADJ or Chauvet, do they need a variance? Generally, no, because they're in the class two range. They're not emitting enough power mm -hmm. um, to where the CDRH and FDA considers them to be dangerous. But as you get into higher powers, things like class three and class four, um, you are required to have, have a variance. So um, the best thing I would recommend is to check out one of the graphs or the diagrams, and it'll show you the exact power levels um, that are required to have a variance in the United States. Um, and we should, we'll post a link to that, uh, in the group as well. Guys. Yeah. I was going to say, send me that and I'll post it. And again, if you guys check this video out on gear should be up by the end of today. If not tomorrow, the very latest, we'll have all those links on there. 
Uh, so Peter asks, what are the dangers of pointing a laser projector at the audience? What type of injury or damage will occur? And I know we answered that briefly in the video, but I know you have a great visual of what can happen. <laughs> yeah, if you go to pangolin.com, we've got um, a whole laser safety section built out. Um, and so when those when beams project up into airspace, if it were to uh, to hit a aircraft, it's not so much the laser hitting the pilot, it's it's if that beam hits the the aircraft window and it diffracts out and kind of causes um, like a distraction to the pilot, you know, mm -hmm. that's the real danger there. Well, I think he's asking if you point it at the audience, like at their eyes directly. Oh, sorry, sorry. So when you're um, when you're projecting into an audience area, yes, um, we have what's called exposure time. So if if you're doing um, audi audience scanning is what we call it in the United States, and you project into an audience area. If um, the real danger comes if you're projecting a targeted beam and and let's say, for example, if the laser malfunctioned in a way where that beam stopped moving and you're the uh, person's eye and the exposure time that they're they're exposed to the laser beam is increased. That's where you have a danger, dangerous event take place. So the uh, um, in the United States, audience scanning is allowed if you have a specific variance allowing you mm -hmm. to do that. Um, but the general rule of thumb when you're performing audience scanning effects is you're trying to reduce that exposure time and ensure that the show is set up so you're operating with what's, within what's called maximum permissible exposure or MPE. Can you uh, real quick show them your phone? Because I want to use this to use a point. So, guys, you know, they say don't take photos of lasers. And sure. this is what happened to his iPhone. You know, I mean, right, accidents happen. Can, uh, and guys, if, if you guys can see the pixel is uh, missing out of the phone now. Yeah, right. <laughs> if that can happen to a sensor just imagine what it can do to the human eye if you don't you know if you're not safe with it so it's one of those that is something going to happen no are you going to risk it no you'd be dumb to ever risk it uh you know i i've been hit before with lasers from being stupid uh, and yeah it hurts for a bit i don't think like you said there has been like any major thank god catastrophes but i think it just takes the one person to do something really bad it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when you know? Yeah, exactly. That's so, exactly right. I mean, you always, when you're working with uh, high power projectors, you always want to just do your best to make sure you're operating in a safe and compliant manner. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially as a professional DJ or production company, it's your reputation on the lines um, as well as the safety of the people in the audience. So you, you just want to do things by the book and make sure you're following the proper safety precautions. Absolutely. And those of you guys watching the live stream, if you have seen the live stream on insurance, remember that your insurance company will cover you maybe the one time if you're lucky. And after that, you're going to get blackballed if you do something as dumb as not following the steps in your variance. I know my insurance company went through a whole spiel with me about that. Um, Peter asked about, uh, actually, it's kind of a back-to-back -back question. He asked about the casinos in Atlantic City that shoot the green lasers in the sky. He said he could see it about 24 miles away. How did they get away with doing that? Was it because they did, you know, they filed that paperwork at the FAA, like you said? Yeah. Um, so I think I know the venue that he's talking about and, and the individual who did that show. And yes, they, um, if they were operating in a compliant manner, which I'm sure they were being a casino, um, they surely must have filed with the FAA prior to the event taking place. So you mentioned about it being an active airspace. Uh, DJ Kaz wants to know on outdoor shows, how do you know if you're in active airspace? He's in Nebraska where there's lots of open space. So general rule of thumb, guys, if you're going to be projecting beams up into airspace, even if you're in kind of a remote area, contact uh, the FAA prior to the show taking place and, and notify them. It's going to protect you. And uh, even if you're in that re remote area, you don't know there could be um, air aircraft flying overweight. So it's just better to be safe than sorry. Um, and contacting the FAA is not very difficult. There are some basic forms that you'll fill out. Um, and you just want to put it on their radar so that they can notify any aircraft in the area. Absolutely. Um, this is actually a really good question. Uh, and this is from David Vallejo. Can la lasers damage other electronic equipment uh, that it may hit while doing a live show? Um, and he says, you know, are there any areas that you recommend to shoot a laser? And I guess where not to shoot. I, I want to save that part for part two of the question. But let's talk about other gear. Can laser damage other gear other than cameras? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you want to be very careful with things like video projectors. Um, we, you know, some people who are new to lasers might not realize if if one of those beams crosses um, one of these nicer video projectors that you see in a lot of clubs or hotels or conference room settings, it can damage that equipment. So 
Um, as we were showing in the, in the stream earlier, we've got some tools in Quick Show, uh, one of them called the Beam Attenuation Map. That's going to allow you to define a blackout area. Um, another safe thing is just make sure your video related equipment is covered up. Um, and then as you start to get into higher power laser equipment, um, you've also got a risk um, if a beam goes static to where it's just a targeted beam projecting out and that's not moving. You also can have a potential fire risk as you get into some higher power equipment. So wow. you want to be be careful of that as well. So it, it can pose danger to um, other equipment if you're not operating it properly or taking the, the right safety precautions. And I guess that also includes asking the venue about any security cameras so you're not burning up their security yes, cameras. Yeah, always, always a good thing to check when you're, you know, if you're going to like a hotel conference room center or, um, you know, a corporate event or something like that, you definitely want to check with the local AV guy just to make sure, hey, is there a video projector in here that I'm not seeing? Is there any AV equipment in here that I might not be aware of? Um, just so you can make sure that you're not going to damage it in some way. We were, it's kind of funny you mentioned this, um, several years ago in uh, 2008, we were at an industry conference and, um, you know, we must have had like 30 lasers set up and nobody saw the video projector that was just, you know, way in the back of the room. And an individual went up there to, um, to kind of demonstrate some of his equipment and uh, he ended up breaking that video projector. Oh. And uh, it was unbeknownst to him, he, um, he got a bill for $10,000 from a oh. hotel. So yeah, you, you definitely want to um, dot your I's and cross your T's in that sense and just make sure that if um, you, you know, you're asking the question, is there anything in this, in this venue that I need to be aware of that uh, could, could potentially get damaged. With a high powered unit, do we have to worry about it hitting like, for example, the little mercury part in the sprinklers, you know, that keeps the one that once pops, it sends water everywhere. Uh, I know that's been asked before. So I was kind of curious. I figured we tied into that. Do we have to worry so, about a fire alarms as far as aiming lasers directly at, or even worse, if it's one of those beam alarm systems? It's it's an interesting question. Um, I've not heard of any instances like that happening. I mean, that would be a pretty rare event, so I don't think it's something you necessarily need to worry about. Um, but what is something you should keep in mind is, um, let's say if there's a chandelier or if there is refractive material in the venue that you're working, mm -hmm. um, and, and I like to use the example of a chandelier because everybody knows how when you project light at a chandelier it can create that disco ball effect. So with a laser, if you have um, like a chandelier or a glass fixture or something like that in your projection area and your beam passes it and light can reflect off, you need to be aware of that and possibly use a tool like a beam attenuation map to block that area out to prevent uh, a piece of refracted laser light from going into an audience area. Awesome. And that kind of answers Peter's question about uh, if there's a danger of the beam continuing in a new direction if you are doing an outdoor show and it hits a window or a mirror type. So I guess same thing, guys. You got to do your due diligence and really research what you're going to project on for sure. That's exactly right. Um, so let's see here. David Evans asked, could you go into a little bit on the how the scan speed of flex or flicker, especially as the scan angle increases overall? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And uh, we actually build optical scanning systems at Pangolin. It's um, right now we hold around 31 international patents for laser and optical scanning related technology. So it's it's something we're very well versed in. Um, so laser in the uh, laser show industry, we define scan speeds in terms of KPPS and we use um, specifications are supposed to be noted at eight degrees optical. Eight degrees is the standard that was set by our trade association, ILDA. Mm -hmm. So as you, for example, if we, if we look at like, um, I'll use a Club Max laser as an example. We Our scan speed is rated to 40K at eight degrees. Um, so when you project our, our test patterns, they're going to be projecting at 40K at eight degrees. As you increase that angle from that, from eight degrees, the scanners have to push a little bit harder to continue tracing all the, the, the points in that projected image. So that's why you might notice as you increase the scan angle of something like a graphic, you tend to notice more flicker. It's because those optical scanners, which are really motors, think about it like a motor, they're having to drive a little bit harder to trace all those projected points. So, um, you know, as you, as you increase the scan angle, if you want to keep the resolution of an image nice, you might actually reduce the scan speed and quick show down a little bit. It's a little, it's kind of a counterintuitive trick. People don't necessarily think, think about that offhand. They're like, I want to go as fast as I can. 
But um, think about like the RPM in your car. Um, sometimes when you're going around a turn, you want to slow down a little bit so that you have better traction. Well, when you're projecting graphical or very point heavy content from a laser projector across a wide angle, you might want to slow that scan speed down just a little bit so that you reduce some of the flicker and you're not driving the motor so hard. So, um, and this, this is stuff that really um, you want to play with because it can be content and cue specific. Um, a lot of the cues in Quick Show are going to look very nice projected from any type of laser projector because we've optimized the content. When it was designed, it was programmed in such a way that it, it would look good even if you possibly don't have such fast scanners inside of your projector. But as you start to get into more custom stuff, perhaps a custom logo, some custom text where you're not optimizing it to the extent that we did, try playing with that scan speed slider and quick show to see if you can, as you increase that scan angle, if you can get the, um, the image to project a little bit more stable um, and that should help. So uh, let's go into the part two of this question. Then he says, if he asks, can we elaborate a little bit more on overdrive into scanners? Because obviously if you go take that scan speed, you know, as high as possible, we're, we're probably going to overdrive them. Um, how do you find the balance between the scan angle and the effect that you are creating? And are there any signs that we're overdriving the scanners? Um, so inside, it's a good question. And inside QuickShow, there's um, a scan speed test pattern. Um, we call it our 30K test uh, test pattern. And what you'll notice, if you project that test pattern, you're going to see um, in the center of it, there's a square box with a circle inside. Mm -hmm. And as, as you increase the scan speed or you increase your angle, that circle will either look distorted. It might, it might go outside of the box or the circle might break. And that's an indication that you might be overdriving your scanners faster than they were actually made to go. Um, unfortunately, there are scan speeds are something that, that some manufacturers don't, they're not, let's say, correctly defining the specification. So people might think that they have, for example, a 40K scanner, but it was specified at four degrees. So they think they can drive it to 40K with no, with no issue. But remember, it was specced at four degrees. Mm -hmm. So if you go outside of that, you could potentially overdrive your scanner. So you, you need to, um, the best test to do is if you have quick show, and you've got a laser projector, project our, our scanner um, uh, test pattern and measure an eight degree angle coming out of the projector and then project that test pattern and see where you stand and set your scanner slider to 30K. That's what the test pattern was made for. And you can kind of begin to measure what your scanners are actually capable of doing. And there's another article on our website at, at pangolin.com in the educational section that talks all about how to actually measure the, the real speed of your scanner. So I would encourage people to read that as well. It'll get a little bit more into the science and the math behind calculating those scan speeds. Awesome. And then David also asked, is there any regular maintenance that should be performed on lasers? It's another great question. And uh, it's kind of projector specific. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would I, I would say, ask the, the manufacturer of your projector um, what they recommend for general maintenance. Um, speaking in terms of some of the lasers that we offer, um, these are these are all built into IP54 rated housings. Um, our modules are completely sealed. Um, the optics are completely protected. We actually go as far to integrate a component called Lasorb onto each diode inside the system to help further protect, protect them and extend the lifetime. So our systems are really made to be maintenance free. Um, but it really depends on the, the projector that you purchased and th that you're using. Um, some basic maintenance, every once in a while, you're gonna wanna clean your optics if you're using the, uh, the projectors um, in a dusty or very hazy environment and you know get some first contact solution and, and, and clean those optics off. Um, you might wanna blow out the fans and just clean those off as well to make sure that there's not too much dust accumulating inside of there. Um, and those are just kind of maintenance 101 yeah. things. But as far as actually going inside of the projector, inside of the module and things like that, it you know if, if a laser is built properly, you really shouldn't have to do that. Absolutely. Um, here's actually one of my favorite questions because it's one a lot of people don't think about. What kind of computing power, and this comes from Jason Gibson, uh, what kind of computing power do you need to run the software? And can this be run on the same computer that may be running DMX software or virtual DJ? Um, so it's gonna depend on if you're running QuickShow or beyond. If you're using QuickShow, any basic laptop's gonna do it, does not require a lot of um, computing power to, to run QuickShow, even if you're driving multiple projectors. Um, and a lot of people do use it in conjunction with other lighting or DMX-based software. 
Um, as you upgrade from there to Beyond, Beyond does use a bit more compute, computing power. Um, and so you might want to go, one of my personal favorites is these, the new Asus laptops. They've, um, they've got a core i7 processor inside, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a very good uh, NVIDIA graphics card. So if you're using Beyond, I would invest into um, an, uh, a higher end computer, something with a core i7 processor. Mm -hmm. Um, 16 gigs of RAM and a good graphics card. If you're running Quick Show, any basic laptop is going to work fine. Okay, you, you got my attention to graphics card. So Beyond is using the GPU for a lot of the mathematical calculations, or well, what's going on? So Beyond's got some visualization um, uh, features built into the software. Um, if you guys are familiar with software like Capture Polar or perhaps Realizer, um, these are software that allow you to visualize the show setup and those are very heavy on your graphics mm -hmm. card um, and inside of beyond we we have plugins that allow you to use realizer capture or light converse inside of the software so that's that's where the the good graphics card comes into play beyond's also got um what we call an enhanced reality preview um and it's it, it's almost i don't i don't want to say it's it's realistic in terms of it looks like actual laser light but it gives you a pretty good idea of how the laser effect will look and that can be a little bit heavy on your graphics card as well so um that's why with beyond we recommend you do use something like a nvidia graphics card or something okay. like that to um to real so you so that you're getting the full benefit of the software of course uh let's see here um da, 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 da. Uh, hang on this was the same type of question um, okay, so loud and clear taxes ask, you know, as a DJ or somebody, I guess, really getting started with lasers, how do you know what to charge? And I, I guess, the, you know, the question really is, it or the answer really can be, it depends, but I guess it depends, like, if, I don't know if he's talking about graphic shows or beam shows. I mean, what have you seen as far as the average cost for even like a one laser show? Okay, so one laser show at a club, I mean, we I, I see anywhere from 200 to $300 per night as kind of a typical fee that gets charged. Um, the, the amount that you charge really be, is defined by a few things. Um, one, the number of projectors that you're bringing to the event. Mm -hmm. um, and as you begin to, to bring out multiple projectors, you tend to charge per projector that you're bringing instead of just per event. Um, if you're doing a pre-programmed show where you're actually building it out on the timeline, people tend to charge based on the amount of programming time that went into to making that show. Um, and that tends to be, I, I see rates right around $200 to $300 per second of content. It can, it gets pretty expensive for ah. pre pro Yeah. It gets pr pretty expensive for pre-programmed content because there's a lot that goes into that. Um, if you're doing a live show though, it, it's generally around, um, it's going to be defined by how powerful the projector is, how many projectors you're bringing out. So if you're using, for example, a two watt unit, you're probably going to be able to charge between 150 to $300 per projector per night. And by per night, are you talking about like a typical four or five hour set or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Your, your, your typical, your typical weekend club show, you know, running probably you might go on around 10, 11 and run till two, three at three at night, depending on where you're located. And I would imagine it'd be more market specific. So in areas where you don't have many laser uh, operators, Absolutely you're going to be able true. to charge more in that area. So Absolutely true. I mean, if you're if you're in a city where there's not a lot of um, other people doing laser shows, you can certainly upcharge a little bit more. Um, also, if you're doing private events or corporate events, the budgets on some of those events tend to be more profitable for the, for DJs and people like that mm -hmm. as compared to the club show. Um you know, I, I definitely encourage mobile DJs to to venture out into the corporate world or into the event planning world or into the um, the wedding and bar mitzvah world because the the budgets seem to be a little bit bigger there from what I've heard from many of our clients. Absolutely. Um, DJ Kaz asked, does Quick Show integrate with Light Jockey? Um, Quick Show will integrate with Virtual DJ, but it's not integrated together with Light Jockey right now, no. So pretty much for DMX integration, it would definitely be a beyond thing. Yes, yeah. I mean, Quick Show's got some basic DMX functionality. There's a tutorial online. Um, it, if you Google uh, Quick Show, Quick DMX, it's going to show you some of that functionality that Quick Show has. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for more advanced DMX control, um, I would definitely suggest going to Beyond. Awesome. 
Uh, let's see here. Just a couple more questions and then we can do the giveaway. Um, actually, this is one of my favorite ones. Michael Thomas asked, would a laser pass through an outdoor tent? And I'll expand by even asking, you know, pipe and drape. I've done pipe and drape. We do lasers, you know, as a, a graphics and some of it actually passed through. And I'm like, oh crap, I got to do it higher because it was actually hitting the audience at that point. So how does the, you know, how does the FDA treat that? If it's going through a, you know, pipe and drape and the beam's breaking up, is it okay? And then as far as a tent, you know, can a laser go through a tent and go into airspace? So it's going to be, again, the power of your laser is going to be a big factor in, is it going to pass through a tent or not? Um, same rule rules are going to apply though. If the, if, laser light is is going through a tent area into an audience area that's not going to be compliant unless you had an audience scanning variance okay if it's going up into airspace and you didn't file faa for faa approval um you would again kind of be breaching on on the border of being non-compliant so you know if there's if there's a chance that that might happen um i would there's a there's some easy fixes you can do to to solve that one create a beam attenuation map two reduce the output power of the projector or three, set your zones inside of the software. Again, those are those tools that are going to allow you to define specifically where, where laser content is going. Set your zones to in such a way that to avoid that sort of stuff from taking place. Okay. Um, and great advice on that. So this one is kind of a mouthful. Nathan Tows asks, what would you recommend if you want to do a show with two floors and shine the laser between the two levels where there is a balcony overlooking the dance floor? It doesn't meet the three meters over the head roll. <laughs> I know that was a mouthful, right? I'm like, I'm, I'm like, wait, let me visualize that real quick. Yeah, let, let, read that off one more time there. Arnaldo. Okay. What would you recommend if you want to do a show with two floors and shine okay. the laser between the two levels? So I'm guessing maybe the, the lighting system's here. There's two levels there. Uh, maybe they have the about, Oh, okay. You know what? It might be like Cuba Libre over in Orlando. So you've got the two floors. There's a balcony in between, and I guess he wants to shine it uh, in between the floors. But he's saying that it doesn't meet the three meters over the head. Man, that second level or must be for like midgets or something. Uh, excuse me, short Americans. Uh, are there so are there people people actively dancing or or you know in that in that second level that mid level area there or is it just open space? You know what, Nathan, do me a favor if you can kind of expand on your question a little bit. Uh, and we'll go to the next one and then we'll go back to yours. So no, no, and no worries. No reason to need to apologize. I mean, it's a good question, but just kind of re-explain a little bit more of what you're trying to do. And then we'll be able to answer. To the that. best thing I would suggest too, is if he's got a picture of the venue uh, that he can email to contact at pangolin.com, we'd gladly take a look at it awesome. um, and, and, you know, kind of work with them to see where an appropriate place to mount the projector would be. Cause it, it is a good question. You, you know, he, obviously he's trying to do things the right way and, I commend him for that, but it, it would certainly help to see the actual venue so I could we could give some some better advice. Yeah, Nathan says that people are standing on both floors, but yeah, if you send him the photo, and that would definitely be a lot easier because yeah, we'll be happy to help you, Nathan. I, I'd just like to see what the venue looks like a little bit more. Yeah, we don't want to give you the wrong advice, especially when you're talking about lasers. So email him, and he'll get you taken care of. Um, and then Dave Evans asks, uh, he's been to a few shows where the beams appear very thick. Is that due to the beam diameter or of the projector itself, or is it the Q? Um, so there's a couple things. It could be it could be on the way that the Q was programmed. Um, you certainly can add what's called a hot point into a, a beam effect mm -hmm. to give an appearance of a, of a bit of a thicker beam, or it could have been on the way that the projector was built. If a projector doesn't have very good what we call divergence, which is in, in very general terms, think about the width of the beam, how fat that beam is. Um, it, that beam might appear wider. Um, one general rule of thumb is you really don't want to have fat beams. And the reason why is over a long distance, the beam is going to be a lot dimmer and a lot less bright. Um, most professionals, when they're looking at laser projectors, are going to look at one that has the lowest divergence possible because the tighter the beam pr profile the more visibly bright it's going to appear over a long distance. So, um, you know, he might have he might have been looking at a cue that was programmed in a certain way to give that fat beam effect, mm -hmm. or he might have just been looking at a projector that wasn't, you know, didn't have a very good beam divergence assigned to it, and so it, it looked like it had a fat beam. But uh, you definitely, I mean, if you're if you're looking at projectors, beam divergence is a very important um, 
uh, specification to consider. You really want to get something that has as low of uh, beam divergence as possible. Around 3.5 millimeter is kind of an industry standard in that, that respect. Um, so, you know, it's definitely something to be mindful of. Awesome. Uh, real quick, we are getting all the names and everybody's punching in their names right now. So if you guys are in the chat, please don't type anything but just your name, one time, one time only. Once you guys punched in your name, please do me a favor. Open up a new tab. Go show Pangolin some love on YouTube. Subscribe to their channel. Uh, you can find Pangolin. They just started, uh, they have an Instagram account here. So make sure you guys find it. It's under Pangolin Laser Systems. So go show them some love on Pangolin Laser Systems on Instagram as well as Facebook. And I know on the website, you, uh, I mean, you've got some serious tutorials going on on the website. Uh, we really try to do a lot on the tutorial front, um, Arnaldo. We, uh, for a quick show, we've got over 19 tutorial videos. For Beyond, we've got, I think, over 70 tutorials now. Um, wow. We've got a ton of tutorials that are discussing um, basic laser educational things, how to set up multiple projectors, how to set up zones. Um, so on our YouTube channel, you're going to find a ton of educational content, guys. Um, and uh, we also published a, a free ebook that you can download. I think Arnaldo shared the link earlier. And on all of our websites, pangolin.com and lasershowprojector.com, you're going to have a full educational section built out um, that's just going to talk to you about basic um, laser education 101. What is a laser show? How to create a laser show? How to set it up? There's tons of diagrams. Um, so all that is, is a, a freely accessible to the public. And um, you, you, know, you guys are welcome to check that out. Awesome. So now let's real quick, the, the names are still pouring in. Uh, let's talk about the, the price. So the winner, tell, tell you know, I guess I'll, I'll let you talk about it. Tell them a little bit what the FB3 is and how it ties into Quick Show as far as their licensing. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to be giving away a new Quick Show 3.0 system. This is the latest version of the software. Um, so you're going to get the classic Quick Show software as well as the new virtual DJ plugin, the new map for the APC Mini. Um, you're going to get the, we've got a couple other features in there that relate to BPM control. Um, so you're going to get all, all those new features for free and you'll get the FB3 QS hardware. This is our most popular hardware. It's um, super easy to use. It's plug and play. You just connect it right to your PC or uh, Mac via USB, and then it'll connect to your laser uh, using an ILDA connection. So you get, get both of those items included with the package. Um, and it uh, looks like Arnaldo said, here we go. So let's, uh, are we ready for the drawing? I am. I think that's all the names. So let's go ahead and, <laughs> all right. I will actually, let's see here. I'm waiting for the random.org to load, copying the names. And again, those of you guys that haven't been here for the other live streams, basically I copy all the names that everybody has put in. Uh, we verify to make sure that you are on the gear at first uh, contest and we go to random.org slash list. So that way nobody can say shenanigans. Uh, real quick, before we announce the winner, I, I love pulling the, before we do, let's talk about the future for a second because the future is Cat6. And you guys have some incredible news, you know, new products regarding Cat6 and all that. So let's talk about the FB forming. What is the future when it comes to laser control? Yeah, we're, we're very excited about this. Um, we've, we recently launched a new hardware platform called FB4. Um, and I like to, to think about it as a media server for a laser show. So this is designed to get built directly inside of your laser projector. So there is no external control and directly from your laptop, you can run a network cable straight to the back of the projector and you're entirely set up and done. There's no hardware in between. Um, if any of you guys have worked with ILDA cable, you probably know how difficult it is mm -hmm. to run over long distances. It's a big clunky cable. You know, it's um, it's certainly a lot easier to run Cat5 cable. It's a more industry standard, especially in the lighting industry. Everybody's running Cat5. So FB4 supports that. But it also is going to support DMX, Artnet, and standalone mode. So if you want to run things from a lighting console, um, FB4 is going to make that exponentially easier. Or if you want to run things from a DMX console and trigger pre-programmed effects, um, you can design your laser cues, effects, your shows, you can design it, design it in Quick Show Beyond, save it to FB4, and then trigger that from a DMX console um, where there's no computer in the setup. So for guys that love the tactile feel of DMX consoles, they're used to that way of running shows, it's a, it's a great benefit. And then most recently, um, we just finished some of the programming on this. Um, FB4 is gonna allow for um, automatic playback. And this is something um, very unique to our hardware. Um, you're going to be able to 
create a show, a cue and animation, and then download that to the FB4. Wow. And then you'll be able to assign a time parameter. So you can say, I want this content that I programmed to play back every Friday for the next six weeks at 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. And you'll be able to define those parameters on the content that you put on the FB4. And then your laser projector with FB4 inside will run that content automatically. All it will need is power. So we just finished the bulk of the development on this. It should be um, released pretty soon. So that's something uh, pretty cool to know. And we've got um, a full line of laser projectors now, all with FB4 built inside. So if anybody is interested in that, you can see these uh, as well. Um, we're also working with our friends over at X-Laser. Laser. They've got some new projectors coming out that have FB4 inside. Mm -hmm. Those are looking pretty awesome too. So. Um, you know, definitely, definitely make sure to check those, those out guys. Cause that is where the technology is, is evolving too. And I know we, we actually talked about the, uh, FB4 in the last show. Um, you know, and somebody said, well, the FB4 costs a lot more and it does, but you know, it's a lot cheaper than having to replace several ILDA cables because people well, wreck them. <laughs> what I would say on that, Arnaldo, is I just po shared a link. So mm -hmm. you guys can see, if you look at the average price of a, let's say a three watt projector on the market, plus an FB3 QS and Quick Show, um, it's actually not much more expensive to buy the projector already with FB4 integrated. Um, you know, generally a three watts going to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $3,000. It seems to be a, a typical industry standard price. Um, and then if you add quick show on that, which sells for 535 uh, end user price, um, you, you know, you're right around 3,500 bucks, but a club max 3000 with FB4 already built inside and the quick show 3.0 software, it's $3,400. So it's, you know, FB4, if you buy it by itself and build it into a projector yourself, yes, it, it is a little bit more costly. But if you're buying it already with the projector as a package, it's not that much. It's it's actually cheaper. It's well, but, actually cheaper. And even if you're buying it separately, I mean, it's I guess it's still cheaper than having to buy the ILDA cables because I can pick up 100 feet of Cat6 for $15. Yeah, I mean, Cat6, Cat5, <laughs> Cat6 cables, definitely cheaper than ILDA cable. We, we provide free ILDA cables with all of our projectors so, mm -hmm. and we don't, we, we're, we don't charge for those accessories, but if ever you did lose an ILDA cable or something like that, Can't go to Walmart. certainly, certainly cheaper to buy a, um, you know, some replacement cat five, cat six cable than it is an ILDA cable. That's for sure. Oh yeah, definitely. And you can go to Walmart and that, do you guys have any ILDA cable? So yeah, do you guys have some <laughs> ILDA cable in stock? Yeah. Um, and actually a lot of questions have popped up about the club max that we use in the video and you know, you and I had just finished a video doing kind of like a tour on that. So guys check that out on gear at first. Uh, we're going to show that plus the disco scan that, you know, that's a really cool lens. Um, yeah. so guys, you definitely want to watch that video. I promise it'll just blow your mind. So let's go ahead and announce the winner and it's kind of awesome. I mean, I'm glad that any, you know, anybody wins. So thank you all first of all for being part of joining in the contest. And thank you, uh, Justin, for, you know, being part of the contest as well. Um, this gentleman said that he's going to have a hard time explaining to his wife why he's going to spend a couple thousand dollars on a laser. You're definitely going to have to explain it now because you just won the software, Jason Gibson. Uh, so congratulations, Jason. Uh, now you just need to buy yourself a good laser. Uh, Justin can help you out with that part, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so Jason, do me a favor. You, you already know how to reach me on Facebook. Uh, give me your email. I will send you an email, get you connected with Justin and, uh, we'll kind of go from there, but yeah, absolutely. Really, really stoked with some of the new features that you have on there. And then, um, I think that and we, I also know, I mean, you know, I, I want to say thank you to all the DJs that, um, joined us for the, uh, for the live stream here as well. And guys, you know, we, we really want to cater to you. Um, we've got a lot of love for the DJ community. Um, and you guys have a lot of great ideas. So if there are features or things like that that you'd like to see from Pangolin, um, be it on the software side, the hardware side, or the projector side, shoot, shoot your ideas over. We're, we're definitely receptive to, uh, to your feedback in that respect. Um, we, we've seen some amazing work coming from individuals in the DJ community. So, you know, we invite you guys to, to share your thoughts as well. So you can reach out to us at contact at pangolin.com mm -hmm. um, or use our contact forms at we, or send us a message on Facebook. We'd love to get your feedback. And uh, guys, real quick, if you are going to DJ Expo, uh, like, you know, our friends at X-Laser, they will be there. They actually have the new Quick Show, so you guys can check that out in person. There isn't a demo of Quick Show available on the website yet, is there? I know that would be Oh, on. absolutely there is. We've got okay, cool. um, 
we can post a link to both. There's a demo version of both Quick Show and Beyond um, available online. So you guys can try it out for free for yourself. Play with it. Um, I'll post these links here uh, right now. Yeah, post the links on the chat. I will post them on the description below so that we guys can check it out. I I'll tell you this because you guys, you know, I've used almost every DMX software and console in the market. Laser is so much easier than lighting in every way, shape, and form. Once you get past understanding safety and how it all works together, it's literally plug and play. Quick Show makes it ridiculously easy. Uh, Beyond does have some real cool features. If you guys saw it on the pre-roll, you can use, you can basically map a video projector with your laser and make that video projector part of your laser show. Um, you have also the connect uh, capability as well, correct, Justin? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and thanks for pointing that out, Arnaldo. So there's um, a lot of people want to do audience scanning in the United States, but, you know, the process of getting audience scanning certified is it, it can be a little bit challenging and a little bit uh, mm -hmm. expensive. So we developed this really cool feature in Beyond called Emulaser. And what that's going to allow you guys to do is to control a video projector as if it were a laser. And with video, there is no regulation in place to say you can't project into an audience area. So what we've done is inside Beyond, you can take all of our laser cues, and if you're using a high contrast video projector, um, you can project our laser cues through the video projector, and it looks almost like a laser. I'm not gonna say it looks as sharp as a laser, but it looks close. And it's a really, really clever way to create an audience scanning effect without having to worry about all the compliance and audience scanning variances and additional safety concerns that go with audience scanning. So if you wanna create an audience scanning effect but you don't wanna worry about those safety things or the hassle of the audience scanning variance, try Emulaser because it's, um, we've got a lot of people using this out on tour right now. Um, Lightwave International, huge, uh, production company in the United States. They they've used this emulator effect a few times at a couple of the shows that they've done. It looks incredible. Um, so it's a very easy way to create that audience scanning effect. And then with the Xbox Connect, that is um, I'll post a video here so the guys can see uh, what this is going to allow you guys to do is to control lasers with the movement of your body using an Xbox Connect. So if you wave your hands back and forth the lasers are going to follow the movement of your hands. Um, you can actually zoom in and out by going like this, and the laser will zoom in and out that with the movement so cool. of your hand. You can, <laughs> you, can all, you can also map the laser. It gets even crazier. You can map the laser to your body parts. So you can, you can um, when the Xbox Connect detects your hand, your head, your leg, your foot, your other hand, you can actually... Um, you can actually map these things out so you can move the lasers in real time with the uh, with different parts of your body. So it's it's a pretty cool um, interactive tool that we've got in the software. That that is trippy. I mean that's that's the big festival stuff that's now you know that any mobile production company can pull off with a little bit of research. It's it's crazy, and I don't think you know those, those of you guys that are new to lasers. It is mind-blowing how much the prices in lasers have dropped because of technology. I mean, and we're always saying, oh, technology is making things more affordable. But my goodness, I remember, you know, when laser projectors cost in tens of thousands for a basic one-watt unit. And I mean, the, the thing is, is there's been a couple good companies, X-Laser being one of them, um, Kavant's another one. Mm -hmm. there, there's companies out there that really have a passion for lasers and for doing things the right way. And they're... they're you know, they're really trying to, to put lasers into the hands of people that want to use them the right way. Um, so I think a lot of the growth within the laser industry can really be attributed to, to companies like X-Laser, like, like Pangolin, like Kivant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, these companies that are just really doing their best to, um, to bring lasers to, to the industry, but in a safe and compliant manner. It's not, you know, it's not about saturating the mar market and selling product, product, product. It's about you know, this is our passion, guys. This is what we do as a hobby, and we want to share it with everybody, but we want to make sure that it's, you know, it's done in a safe way because we're dealing with what could be a dangerous technology. So I, I'm glad to see that in the last few years, a couple of good companies have really stepped up oh, yeah. and, and kind of um, brought this to the masses, but in the proper way of doing things. Absolutely. So 
Um, I guess with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up the show, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in again. Go show Pangolin some love on YouTube, Facebook. We posted those links. I'll post those links below once the video gets done. And we do all our fancy magic YouTube editing and, and all that. So I'm here with Justin from Pangolin. I'm Arnold Thanks Hoffman. again for joining us, guys. I'm Arnold Hoffman. Give it first. You guys have a great evening. Good night. God bless. Bye.